Well, last week um, we, we talked about this uh, idea of living for eternity and, and living for that moment when you cross that line. And we talked about how there are so many here in church and on this earth who live for their lives here on earth. And, and, but then at the end of that passage, and I kind of shortchanged it because we ran out of time, but I wanted to read the passage again to you at the very end. He says, but our, Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. Okay, the, for, for many of us, our citizenship, our home, where we're citizenships, we're, we're, we're citizens of this kingdom in heaven. That's why when the, the economy down here falls apart, we're okay with it because this isn't where our citizenship is. This isn't where we put our treasures, where we put our home. And so while people are losing their treasures, they're going, well, I invested everything in heaven. And so as long as God's still alive, I'm okay. You know, our citizenship is in heaven. And he says, and, and we wait, and from it, we wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It talks about how he's going to uh, transform our bodies from these lowly bodies to make our bodies like his glorious body. And I, 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 I never really gave that a ton of thought. And this morning as I was reading it again, I thought, wow, that's an amazing thought that someday this body, which the Bible says all of our bodies are lowly bodies, you know? And, and, and I, I know we live in a culture that says, no, that body is pretty nice, this one isn't, you know? And we judge this or that, this, you know? But biblically, biblically speaking, it just goes, you know what? Do you, do you even understand the difference that's going to take place between your earthly body and the heavenly one? That any moment when Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to be transformed and we're going to become like him. And that's an amazing thought. And he says, after he says that, he goes, therefore, because you know that's happening, therefore, he says in verse 1, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He says, because of that, he says, you guys stand firm. And I just want to say that right now for, for those of you here that are trying to live for heaven. And I know that there are, there are many of you in this room that are trying to live for heaven. And the word of God says, stand firm. Don't give up on that. It's going to be worth it. Any moment, this is all going to change. And I know some of you guys are staying in relationships and you don't want to, but you're doing it because of the Lord and you're fighting for it. And I'm saying stay the course. Others of you, there's so much temptation coming your way and you just want to give in. You so want to throw in the towel and give in and it's tempted in every way. And I'm saying hold on because any moment this is all going to change. Don't live for this time on earth. Jesus Christ is going to return at any time and it will be worth it. Hold on. Some of you guys are living just for eternity. Some of you guys are making money just, just to give it away. That's your whole purpose in life. As you're going to know, I'm here in Southern California. The reason why I'm here is because I'm going to make a ton of money and I'm going to give it all away. It's not for me. I'm not going to take 90% of it and give 10%. I, I'm doing it all for others. I want to care for them. I'm saying, you know what? You look stupid. You look really dumb doing that. But hold on because there's going to come a day when it's worth it. And everyone else is going to look dumb for spending it on themselves. That day is going to come and Paul says, hold on, hold on. We have to stay focused, you guys. We, we, we just do. We've got to stay focused as a church on what our purpose is in caring for people, rescuing people, doing everything we can for them. At our elder meeting this week, um, Dave Phillips uh, just came back from Cambodia and Thailand, and, and we had had lunch the day before, so at the elder meeting, I was like, hey, Dave, do you mind sharing some of the of what you experienced there. And, uh, and he just told us, just the first story already killed us. He told us about uh, being out there, and um, I don't know if you've heard of an organization called International Justice Mission, IJM. It's a Christian organization, a bunch of attorneys, and, and they legally go to these different places to break up the brothels and, uh, and, and do it in a way that, that uh, these people have to listen. And, and he was at this one place where IJM had just broken up a brothel. And then there's a couple of organizations that come around on the other side, Zoe International and, and, uh, and Aim for Asia. And, and, and then they house those, those ladies that have been taken out of these brothels. And he was at this one where there were 55 women that were removed from this brothel and then brought into this safe house, you know, where these believers come and minister to 
them and care for them and show them their worth and, and explain to them that they're, they're not just pieces of meat. They're, 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 they're children of God and they're creations of God and they're beautiful people. And, 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 and there were these 55 girls from age 18 to 20 that were staying in this house. For, I'm sorry, age 8 to 20. And uh, they're staying at this home. And Dave is just sharing about what it felt like when he was describing the conversation he had with a 10-year-old girl who had been in a brothel for the last couple years. And when he was done, you've got these grown men in a room just crying, trying to pray, and you just cry because everything in you as a man wants to defend and fight and and then all of us having kids of our own start picturing our own kids and you just go, man, I gotta, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. We gotta do something. There is the pain of knowing how many millions of people are living in that condition and yet the joy of seeing that, wow, the rescuing of those and, and, and more and more and more every day, the rescuing, there brings this joy where you go, what else am I gonna do with my life, Right? I mean, what, what, what's going to bring you greater joy than rescuing people like that? And, and it also, the thought comes to mind, when do I look more like Christ than when I'm rescuing people? Is there anything I can do to make me look more like Christ? I mean, we just sang about Jesus, how he came down, love came down and rescued me. I thank you, I thank you, because I was that slave. I was enslaved to my sin. I was destined for an eternity of, of punishment, and yet God looks down and goes, oh, those helpless people. Uh, so in their helplessness, in their sin, I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna rescue them. I'm gonna care for them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna die on that cross. I'll be nailed so so they can be forgiven. Here, I'll take, I'll take the pain. I'll take it for them, and I'll rise from the grave to show them that there's something after this. He did that for me. And so how, if, if we're supposed to be image bearers of Jesus Christ, then shouldn't our lives be about sacrifice and giving up for these people who need rescuing? And I, I, I don't look at that as this burden and this pain. of. Bum I go, man, that's what I want to do. I mean, what you want to do, don't you go, man, that's so cool that the money we give goes to things like that. And there are people that are out there doing those things. And some of you guys have gone overseas and seen some of this stuff. And there's no greater joy than living that way. And on top of that, we know at the end there's a reward for all of that. And you just go, well, how else am I going to live except for these people? And I, I just got to say again, and I know I talk about this a lot, but you guys, we have to be about this. As a church, we can't get sidetracked and, and start nitpicking little things and complaining about this or that. As a church, we always have to understand we've got a mission in front of us. And it's to the physically and spiritually impoverished to do everything we can to rescue them with the good news and with our resources. And I, I, I was, uh, after Dave uh, said that, I, I read Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, uh, an amazing passage. Um, but it's, it's, it's this passage where, where Israel's crying out to God and God says, I'm not listening. Did you know that? Did you know there are times when God says, I'm not listening to your prayers. You can talk to my hand. I, I'm not going to talk. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to hear that. See, sometimes we think, oh, no, no, God listens to all the prayers. No, he doesn't. Read the Bible sometimes. There's times when he says, your prayer is an abomination to me. I'm not going to listen to that. Other times when he says, you know, you're just praying for your selfish desires. You're not going to get that. Other times he says, you know what, I, I listen to the prayer of a righteous man, that's powerful and effective. You're praying with doubt, <laughs> then you're a double-minded man, unstable, you're not going to receive anything you ask for. There are many times when he says, I'm not listening to you. And Isaiah 58 is one of those times where he's, he's, he tells the prophet Isaiah, just tell these people, tell the truth, that I'm not really listening to their prayers. Isaiah 50, 58, he says, cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sin. Verse 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? 
See, these people are saying, God, how come? You know, we fasted. I went without food. I got on my face. I'm begging you. I'm humbling myself. And, and, and God says to them, you're talking like you're a righteous person, like you're actually listening to me and doing what I ask you to do. And then you cry out and I don't listen to you. And then in verse, uh, at the end of verse 3, he goes, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Then look at verse 5. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? And the key is verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If. You take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, speaking of wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. God says, you want me to listen to you? You want me to listen to you? Okay, why don't you, why don't you quit you know, gaining from other people's poverty and why don't you instead start changing things? Why don't you live for the sake of the hungry? When you see someone naked, why don't you clothe him? Why don't you see the people who are in bondage and break that yoke, cut those chains off, somehow do everything you can to rescue these people? He says, and then when you cry out to me, I'll go, here I am. And I go, man, that, isn't that what you want of God? Is <laughs> just to have that connection where it's like, you know what? God's listening to me. He's there with me. Why? Because I'm busy about these things. He says, I don't care if you you sit there and humble yourself and bow on your face all day long. He goes, unless you start living some of this stuff, I'm not going to listen to you. You do this. If you do these things, he goes, then you can call me. and I'll say, here I am. That's my heart's desire. That's why as a church, I go, we can't ever get away from caring for those who are in need and rescuing, because that's when we look like Jesus. Jesus came down and rescued us and gave us an example to follow. You know, the last few weeks we've been talking about some of this stuff, and, uh, and every week, for the last three weeks, the same question keeps coming back. Yes, but how does that look in Simi Valley? Right? How do we do it here? Because I can understand if we go overseas, yeah, I would probably do that. Maybe I would try to grab kids out of this place or whatever, and I would somehow try to say, but here in Simi Valley, what do I do? First, let me say that, that, that the thing Dave was saying, coming back and working with all those workers in Thailand and Cambodia, you know what the, the biggest problem is, the, the biggest cause of all of that? It's Americans. They're the ones coming over, and they're the ones who have the money to pay for all of this all the, the slavery and whatever else. The problem is America. So much of the, the rich that are going over there and exploiting these people and taking advantage of them. And so this isn't a message for everyone else out there. It's, it's about the hearts of the people here and truly having God change those things. But, but practically, what does it look here in Simi Valley? How's it? And that's a great question. It's an excellent question because we've talked about suffering for the sake of the gospel, right? We talked about focusing on eternity and not, not the stuff that's, that, that's right now. We've talked about being led by the Spirit, but how does that look in Simi Valley? And, and so I want to share some thoughts on that, and I want to be careful. I want to be careful not to, not to, not to give you, because I want to share just some things of, that other people in the church have done without mentioning names. But I want to be careful that you don't think that I'm saying, well, here's this person's experience. Therefore, that's what you're supposed to do. Okay, we don't want to turn experience into principle. Because God is going to lead each of you in different ways. It's just that at the end of the day, you've got to say, am I even surrendered and saying, God, please lead me. I've got to do something today, whatever the cost. And once you start praying like that, I guarantee you God will answer your prayer. Um, 
I've shared before about uh, the couple in the church in their late 50s that they're the ones that helped me become aware of the, the orphans and widows right here in our area. And they said, man, we've just been taking care of foster kids for years. And now in their late 50s, they've got 11 of them in their house. Um, no excuses about age or, well, but those are unique people. No, not really. He's a mechanic. She's a hairdresser. Normal jobs, normal people that just said, you know what? God says true religion is to care for the widows of the orphans. So if they're here, I've got to take care of them. I'll, I'll find some way. And so they spent their lives taking care of them. And now their kids are doing the same thing. Just, just, just normal people. I was talking to a couple this week that said, you know what, we've got our two kids, and then we have this other family, they've got their two kids, and we thought, why do we have two houses? If the, if the eight of us could just live together, we could save a mortgage payment and give all that money away. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's good, if that's what God's led you to do. Another couple that said, you know, found out there was a family of four in the church that was about to go homeless, and they said, you know what, come live with us, just live with us, we'll, we'll figure it out, just live with us. You know, our kids are grown up, they're out of the house, your whole family can live here, and they've been there for months. Another, another couple that said, you know, you, you talked about simplifying and downsizing. We thought, man, we can't downsize anymore. So we, we decided to move into an RV and, uh, and let other people live in our house. And so, you know, our way of simplifying was living in an RV. Another guy who I talked to last week that said, you know, I, I just want to care for whoever I can. You know, the people that are most rejected. And he thought, what, who are the most rejected people? Because I want to go and rescue and care for them and love them like Christ. And so he says, I'm gonna, I, I'm, we're going through the foster care. And he goes, my wife and I were talking. He goes, let's go to them and say, we want the person that no one will take. Maybe it's a kid that's, that's on all sorts of machines and is 16 years old and still in diapers. And we got to care and clean and feed and everything. He goes, man, we just want to surrender ourselves to someone like that. And I'm like, man, that, these are heavy things. You know, we had, a, we had you know, every, every week the foster classes here, I know that 75 to 100 of you have been coming every week. You know, we had a great worship service this morning, but I'll tell you, it was a better worship service yesterday with 75 people that are sitting in a class for six or seven hours learning about foster parenting and trying to figure out how to care for some of these people and care for their needs. That's worship. That's an amazing worship service. That's an amazing, that's, that's a worship service that Ventura County has never heard of until Cornerstone Church a few weeks ago. And they said, you don't understand, we've never had more than a dozen people in these classes, you know, and now we start doing them here and you've got 75 to 100 people showing up. That's unheard of. That's worship. You know, that's, that's a crazy stuff I'm talking about here. I, 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 there, there are people in our own church that are doing some mission stuff overseas in in places where Christianity is persecuted and the persecution has followed them to the U.S. and there have been death threats on their lives right here in the U.S. You know, there's people in our church who who go to the prisons every week, people in our church that that, that, uh, go into the skid row and and are there, you know, uh, all day long, every day, just just trying to help the people down there. There's other people in our church, you know, another guy who just said, you know, and this was before the housing market crashed, you know, at the peak, he just gave us the keys to his house and said, you know what, sell it, give the money to the poor, do something, you know, a couple hundred thousand in equity, I'm going to go live with my parents because I want the reward in heaven. Like, right on, right on. Just, there's, 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 I get, I get email, emails every week, every week from people all around the nation that are getting it. Doctors that are quitting their practices here, that were doing it for money and saying, you know what, I'm going to go overseas. They need it more over there. And just, we're selling everything. We're going for it. Dentists, attorneys. I got one from an attorney a couple weeks ago that said, you know, making all this money and everything else and, you know, listening to some of the messages there, I decided, you know, I, I'm moving, I moved to the Philippines six months ago to work with international justice ministers and to try, them, try to help them out. And I'm just going to do that the rest of my life now, is use my skills in law to now break the yoke of slavery all around the world. Others who are saying, no, I'm staying right here. I'm making a ton of money. I'm going to make a fortune, but I'm not going to spend it on myself. I'm not going to spend 90% on myself. I'm going to live off the bare minimum, and I'm going to give the 90% away. Businessmen, cops, everyone, people doing this. I had, a, I had another guy just a couple weeks ago, again, talked to him on the phone, who, who a few months ago very successful businessman, just going, what in the world am I doing making a home for myself here? Sold his home, sold everything, packed up he and the three or four kids, and they moved into an RV and said, let's just travel around America and help people everywhere we drive, wherever we go. Just I don't even know what we're doing. We're just driving around helping and doing whatever we can to care for the needs of other people. It's, it's, uh, it's been pretty powerful. 
There have been a lot of people doing a lot of different things and people going to the ends of the earth and people right here in Simi Valley that are going for it. But they decided, what I hear from them all, is they start with biblical conviction. These are not people who heard a word from God, like an audible voice, because sometimes we go, well, God hasn't called me. God didn't tell me to do this. God didn't tell me to do that. God told those people to do that, but he hasn't told me this. And I'm going, have you, have you read this lately? Oh you, oh, you mean you need an audible voice? Not like the rest of us that can just read the word of God and go, ah, I should do something about that. You want to hear a voice directly from God. You don't need to hear a voice from God to go to the movies. You don't need to hear, oh, but God didn't tell me to watch TV. You don't care. But to serve him and actually do something for the kingdom, then you need to hear an audible voice, right? And the written word isn't enough. You guys, these are people that are just saying, man, I'm just reading this. I'm, I'm looking, I'm thinking about the poor, and I'm going, okay, I got to do something. Here's what I can do. And they're praying, Holy Spirit, help me. And it is spirit-led. It is, it is, but, but you start with that, okay, here's what the word of God says. God, show me what I need to do. And I'm just going to pursue things. I'm just going to go after it and see what happens. And then as you do that, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you. You'll be directed, but it's, it's out of a desire, a heart saying, I want to rescue. I mean, doesn't your heart, doesn't something, when you hear those stories about people being rescued, doesn't, doesn't everything in you just leap going, I want to do that. I want to do that with my life. That seems so much more fulfilling. That seems so much cooler, just to devote my life. It's not, I'm not asking you to do something you're going to hate. Yeah, there'll be times when it's rough or whatever else. I'm asking you to do something that you'll love and at the end of your life actually have a fulfillment that you did something with your life and then at the end of your life also realize, wow, I am stoked for all of eternity because of what I did when I was on that little planet. That's what I'm asking you to do is to devote your life to this. I'm a little bit hesitant in sharing what I'm about to share right now, Um, but I've talked to some elders about it to make sure Talked to my wife about it, talked with several others about it, and biblically, I believe it's right. Um, my hesitancy is I want to, because I don't know what motivates other people. All I know is myself and what goes on in this mind, this heart, and this body. And so I, I want to share some of those things to help you understand how I flesh this stuff out. And yet my concern, and I talked it over with my wife this week, was just looking at Matthew 6, where he tells the hypocrites, hey, don't go, don't go brag into everyone about what you've done in order to be seen by them. He goes, if that's what you want, you'll get your whole reward right there. But when you do something, do it in secret. And yet I, I wrestle with that and then also how the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul laid out everything that he did. He laid out all of his suffering because he was defending his apostleship. It was at a time when people were skeptical of Paul and going, man, is he the real thing? And he's like, man, look, look at how I live. And he goes, why are you following those other people who live this way? And I know that we live in a time when everyone's skeptical, that I can say something from up front, but there, there's, just because the pastor says it, no one believes that. And, and you shouldn't. And I said, look at my life. Follow me. And that's what I loved about Tim's message last week, that he could say, follow Courtney and I. Follow our example as we follow Christ. I'm like, you know what, right on. And there is a responsibility of me as a pastor to say, you know what, don't just listen to what I say, because I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be. That was the problem with the Pharisees, is they would talk, 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 and they didn't do anything. And that's really important to guard against in our own lives. And I want you to trust me, and I want, uh, I want this to be a family. And, and Paul constantly writes in his book saying, you know what, you know how I lived among you for, my, for your sake. He goes, I, I, I'm really, I really believe this stuff, you guys. This is, not a, this is not a job to me. It really isn't. In fact, literally, it is not a job to me. I, I don't get paid by the church. Did you know that? Do you know why I'm here? I'm, I'm here because I actually, I really, I don't know if you believe it or not, I actually care about you. And I really think about what it's going to be like at the end. And I want you to be there with me. And I want you to hear, well done. That's why I'm here. A couple years ago, I asked the elders. I said, you know what? I, I want to just do this as a volunteer. Other people, you know, Jim and, and the whole band, you know, they, they're here all day long. None of them get paid. They're at Thursday night, you know, practicing. They don't get paid. They're just volunteers. They've got to work jobs like everyone else. I go, I want to, I want to be like everyone else. I want to just, just get my money somewhere else and serve the church. A year and a half ago, they said, no, we, we, we want you to be a, as a paid employee. 
And then uh, I was like, you know, that's fine. I'll surrender to the, the elder board and I'll just keep my salary, which was, you know, 36 grand for the last, you know, 14 years. And then uh, this last year, I said again, I go, you guys, it's still on my heart. And this year they go, okay, you know what, volunteer. You know what, you're, you're, we fire you, <laughs> you're, you're done. And, and I'm like, good, good, you know. And so, so I can look you in the eye this morning going, I, I don't need to be here. I don't, I don't get anything out of this. What I get out of this is, is the thought that I'm going to, uh, for all of eternity, that maybe my gift in teaching could help you. Just like some of you guys teach Sunday school, some of you guys come midweek, some of you guys, so a lot of our people are in prisons right now, well, they're in prison, and then others are there preaching to them, you know? <laughs> we, we, uh, some of you guys, some of you guys came out of the prisons, and you, you were saved in the prisons through some of our people, and I go, right on. You know what? And, and let's just give, let's just serve, let's just do that. And I want you to understand that's why I do what I do. This is, this is real stuff to me. Um, there's a lot of other things I could be doing this morning. But I choose to be here. And I love this church. And I love some of you. I mean, I love all of you a little, you know. But there's, there's others that I, that I really love because I've known you for years. And I'm going, you know what? I, 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 I want you there with me. I, I want you there forever. And that's why I'm here. And... And I, I want you to know that. And some of you guys go, well, you know, okay, so you don't need this job because you wrote that book and, you know, you're going to make all this money off of it. You know, and, and, and it's true. You know, my royalties are about to come in. And uh, they're, they're estimating that this next year I, I could make about a half million dollars. And, uh, and, and uh, I looked at my wife and I said, you know what? What are we going to do with half a million dollars? I don't need that. And I don't want to spend it on things that I don't really need. And I also don't want to stop living by faith. Um, if we have half a million dollars in the bank, we'll just live comfortably and I don't have to worry about anything. You know, I don't need faith. I don't need God. I'll just keep getting royalties off of this thing. And so we said, let's just sign over the royalties to where we can never touch any money of the book. And, uh, and we put it in what's called a charitable gift fund. And I just signed the note and said, okay. I release it all. doesn't matter how much this makes. I don't get a dime of it. And it all goes in a fund that can only be given to different charities. So if Cornerstone needs money, I can write a check for 100 grand. If CHF needs a check, you know, I'll, I can write a check. If I want to buy a double-double, I can't use that money. I, I can't, I can't, uh, because I, I, go, I don't even want that temptation. Because if I spend that at the end of my life, I'm going to regret it for all of eternity. I mean, I could easily go, oh, you know, we'll, we'll give 15% and only live off of 400000 a year. Or, you know, it, it's just, come on. You know what? This is, this is about eternity. This is about the white part of that rope, as we were going back to last week. It's not about these few years on the earth. And you know what's cool is, is even as we, you know, so, so they said, okay, what, what's, what are you going to write this? What name, what's the name of the charitable gift fund? And we said, I said, you know, call it the Isaiah 58 fund. Isaiah 58 fun. So this way, if people don't know Isaiah 58, they'll, they'll look up Isaiah 58, and, uh, and they'll read it. And, uh, and then my wife and I just prayed, like, God, show us, because a lot of money is going to come in. Where do you want this money to go? What charities do you want, us, want it to go to? And we just prayed, because we don't know. I don't know. If we, do we just give it all to the church? Do we get, you know, what do we do? And, and so we said, no, God, show us, show us. We want you to show us supernaturally. So that was on Monday that I signed everything over to the Isaiah 58 fund. On Wednesday, I met that pastor I was talking about last week, the guy from India, from Marissa. And as he's sharing about all of his you know, friends that are in family that have died, and he shared about the 50,000 believers that are homeless out there, our brothers and sisters, my heart just began to break. I started thinking, man, this is it. These are our brothers and sisters. We've got to do something about it. You know, so my heart just stirred, and I prayed for this guy. When it was all done, his friend who was with him, who's from America, said, yeah, you know what? And, uh, you know, pray for us because we're starting this project that's going to try to help rebuild. In fact, I could use your input. How do we help these people? But I started this project, and he lays like this 10-page paper down. He goes, it's called the Isaiah 58 Project. <laughs> and, uh, and I go, shut up. And he's all, and he's like, what? I go, just two days ago, two days ago. I just signed everything over this Isaiah 58 fund and my, prayed with my wife, where do you want this to go? And then you come in and this guy from India and I'm hearing his story and I'm just moved already and then you throw that in my face. You know, it's just so like, 
I don't know what I'm doing. And just step by step, keep in step with the Spirit. Go, I think we should do this. I think we should do this. And then God answers the rest of it. And, uh, and I know some of you guys are going, man, but, but what about you? And, what, and, and they said, you know, okay, so maybe, maybe you don't have anything to spend that, that money on, but, but shouldn't you at least save a portion of it in case of emergency? Right? Wouldn't that be prudent? And my question to you is, are you saying that what's happening in Thailand and Cambodia is not an emergency? Amen. Oh, I see. You mean an emergency involving me. Because those are the only emergencies that really matter. Right? Because it's about me and my family and not the family of Christ and all these other people. And so as these little girls are, are, are being, you know, just mistreated all around, that's not an emergency because it doesn't involve me. You guys, we got to start thinking biblically. And that, that would be Jesus looking over the earth and going, wait, that's not an emergency. That doesn't affect me. No, it does affect him because he so loved the world. And God the Father so loved the world, and so what happens around the world does affect me. And it is an emergency to me, because I'm called to love as Jesus loved. People say, well, if you're going to live that way, you know, then, then why, you know, then you, you can't even buy a car, because, you know, Jesus wouldn't buy a car. <laughs> really? You don't think Jesus would buy a car if he lived in America right now? I, 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 no, sir, because I pray about all this stuff, and I, and I, I do. If, 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 but I, I start thinking just time management, my time or whatever. It's like, wow, when I speak over here, here, here. Yeah, I could walk to Azusa. <laughs> it just seemed, you know, like, gosh, time management and what would be best is, is I'll do it. But even as I buy the car, I think through, okay, Jesus, what would you buy? And it's your car. It's your money. A few years ago, just, you know, bought this little Nissan because I thought, okay, this is, you know, it's old. It's like three grand and it should run forever. It's an import, you know, and we'll just buy this little thing. And, and uh, so I drive that around for a little while. And then, then we go to the Imagine trip with the church and we're down in Mexico. And I drove my little Nissan, you know, we named it Si Se Puede, you know, and it was my little <laughs> Si Se Puede car, and, you know, and, and, and we're there. And, and, uh, and I'm driving this pastor around down there realizing he doesn't have a car and he's been praying for one and then I think you know what I live in America I can make money somehow it's not that hard for me to scrounge up a couple thousand dollars and buy a car when's this guy ever going to be able to pull that off see I can do it he can't and as I began to love this guy more and more during the day and then I talked to my wife and we're both in tears as we handed him the keys and just said you know what I'll, I'll hit you right back this is God's car, and I think he, he says, you, want, you, you need it more than I do. We'll, we'll figure it out. Come back here, and someone in the church, you know, who was on the trip with us said, you know what? I saw what you did, and you know what? Let me buy you a car. I was like, all right. <laughs> you know? And, you know, we find a little Subaru, you know, it's 3800 bucks, you know, and, and, and then it'll run forever, too, and had that for a couple. Yeah, I, I go, well, I think Jesus would drive this. I, I, think, I, think he would, I think he would drive that, and you just figure it out, you know, the home, you know, well, why do you have a house? Like, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I struggle with that one sometimes. We, we were in a house. The first time I came back from Africa and I came back, I looked at my house like, I can't live here anymore. It was just crazy. I saw the way people live and I, I don't think Jesus would live in this house. So, so let's, let's sell it. And my wife's like, all right, all right. And that's downsize. And we started looking at trailer parks and look at different opportunities out here and found this little thousand square foot beat up house. And let's just buy that thing. And then we started, you know, our family started growing, which was fine. But then we took in some people to live with us. And they were living in the garage. And I thought, ah, that's not totally legal. And, you know, and, and uh, it's just, okay. And then, uh, and then her, her parents were going to retire. I was like, well, you know what? That's a responsibility too. And so we bought like a 1,200 square foot house and said, you know, we could, we could add on here and built an addition for the in-laws and so that now they could live there and there's like 10 of us in this house. Well, we've been praying about that because now it's, it's at a point where the in-laws are going to be moving out and, and moving to Colorado and, and, and retiring there. And, and so we, we start praying. What do, we, what do we do with this house now? You know, what do we do with this room? We have a couple extra bedrooms. Um, 
That, those are God's bedrooms. You know, someone should be using those things. And, and so we start praying. And my wife, you know, had this, this desire in her heart. She goes, you know, I've, I, I just, for some reason, God's given me a heart just feeling like our family's not complete. Our family's not complete until we, we take in people that aren't of our blood, you know, descent or whatever else. That, 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 you know, it's adoption that he's put on my heart. What a picture of what God has done for us and how he adopted us and grafted us in and made us his children. He goes, I want that. And, and so whether it's kids overseas or whatever, and so we start praying and saying, God, you know what? We believe this is what you want based upon scripture, how you're a father to the fatherless. So God, help us with this because we want, we just start with prayer and I don't know. And I say, God, and I want it supernatural because everything I do, I say this, I God, I want it supernatural. I don't want to just go through the process like everyone else. I, I should have a secret in with you, you know, where, where I, I ask for something and, and it should happen because you're God and it's for your desires. And so just bring some kids. And so, so each morning I'd open the door and look, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> There weren't any yet, so I, I was like, well, well, if there's nothing there, I'm just helping you understand process here. You're like, well, nothing showed up, no one showed up, let's, let's take the foster parenting classes, and let's just join the you know, people at Cornerstone, and, and, and it's obvious, maybe that's what God's saying. Well, of course, there's a bunch of people screaming out for parents. Why do you want a special, you know, thing? so let's, let's go through that and that, that thing, and and then, uh, you know, so we've been going to the class, or she has been, I've been gone, so she has to sit through them. And, uh, and, uh, and then on Tuesday, Tuesday, unbeknownst to me, Lisa's praying. Unbeknownst to me, she's just praying and saying, God, I really, I really want you to show me who ought to live there. That same day, I'm having breakfast with Jim, um, who, you know, who also doesn't work at the church, but does this as a volunteer. And we're, we're just sitting there talking, and, and, and his wife had bought a bunch of diapers for this lady at the rescue mission, because some of you from the church go to the rescue mission every Wednesday night and cook for them, and saw that there was a woman who was homeless and was about to give birth. And so she's never going to have a baby shower, so Cornerstone people are going to throw her a baby shower. And, uh, and, and Jim's wife was saying, you know, just, just how, you know, they got these diapers, and Jim was thinking, you know, it crossed my mind, like, maybe I should uh, take her in, like, care for them, but I don't know how many there are, I don't know if I could do it. And then I, I was like, wow, that never even entered my mind. Um, then I found out she doesn't speak English, her husband left, she's got four kids, Three of them and one on the way. She's a 10 year old, a three year old, one year old, and she's about to give birth any day now. And, you, and so I call the mission. I go, How in the world does someone like that make it? How in the world are you going to make that? How, how does she ever get back on her feet again? Like, I don't get it. There's, 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 he goes, Yeah, there's, there's really, I don't know. There's no answers to that one. And I, I, so I, I went home, talked to my wife. I go, You know, that's just a crazy thought, but you know those two rooms. And uh, I was talking about that lady that you guys are going to do that baby shower for. I go, what if we had her whole family live here? And she just looks at me. She goes, I got the chills right now. She goes, I prayed today specifically that God would show us who should live there. And uh, I says, well, she doesn't speak English. You know, I don't have even met her. Neither of us have. Why don't we just drive down to the mission right now and go meet her? Like that's what the spirit would want us to do tonight. So we drive out there, and it's like, hola. <laughs> uh, a que hora es? <laughs> you know, it's like whatever Spanish phrase we could come up with, you know, and just uh, she kept telling us what time it was, and, you know, and, uh, but it's like, uh, quieres vivir en mi casa? <laughs> you know, and I think I asked her to stay with us, you know, uh, I don't, you know, and I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, and I, I don't know what the future is. I, and, I, and again, I'm hesitant in sharing this stuff, but I, I believe, uh, I'm just telling you that I have so many issues. I, I have so many weaknesses. Um, I'm just trying to figure something out. I'm just trying to help people overseas, help people here, help you, um, help my family understand that this is not our home down here. Uh, I heard a great quote this week. For, it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and he said, We should love, but we should love with the love which expects death. We should love, but we should love with the love which expects death. That means, should I love my wife? Absolutely. But I want to love her knowing that she's going to die and stand before God. 
and knowing that she's got a whole eternity before her. In fact, a couple weeks ago, she says, hey, I was thinking about this thing. You know, it's going to cost like three or four grand, and do you think we should do it? I go, you know what? We could afford it, but I said, I don't want you to do something you'll regret for all of eternity. I don't want to spend money that at the end we're going to go, well, we, we're just going to regret. I want to make sure we're investing for eternity. She goes, yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah, we, we don't need that. See, I want to love with a love that expects death. I want to love my wife thinking about, oh, I want to so prepare her for that moment when she sees God because that's going to be for eternity, and that's the real love. And I want to love my kids in that same way, and I just want to spend my life doing that, and I'm here because I want to encourage you to do the same thing. I want to cross that line together, and I want to look at you for all of eternity and say, see, he told you. I told you it was worth it. I knew he would reward us. I knew he would bless us. He's a giving God. We'll never outgive him. This isn't a burden I'm throwing on us, I don't think. I think it's a desire of our hearts, isn't it? Where you want to live for that. And we got to get rid of this excuse of, oh, I'm not going to change the world. No, you're not. But you might for one person, you might for a few people, you might even for a few people for one night. It's just, are you doing what you can? And isn't that the desire of your heart? Like I said earlier, I don't think... I don't think there's anything we can do to make us look more like Christ than to go out and rescue people. And that's why I shared what I shared. I want you to know that I'm not up here preaching something that I don't live. I, we, give, we give a fortune to this church because of that. And I don't take anything from it. And you need to know that, that I believe this. And I believe that I'm going to look at you in heaven and go, see, I told you it was worth it. And I, I believe what Jesus said about you lose your life, you lose this American dream down here and live for the kingdom of God and you're going to find life. And I believe I found it. I believe I'm one of the happiest men on this earth because it is far more blessed to give than to receive. And if you are ready to die to your old life and live anew and live like Christ, then come up here and get baptized. That means you're dying to the old you and you're rising again to a new life. And you get the opportunity to do that because God came down and rescued you. Because he left the comforts of heaven. And he didn't consider equality something to be grasped. Equality with God. But he humbled himself and made himself nothing. And he says, now I want you to follow my example. You give up your comforts. And you live for other people. You follow me. And in the same way I say to you, you follow me as I follow Christ. It's a life of dying to yourself to find true life. I mean, you can try to save your life. You can try to save all your stuff and, you know, and everything else and stress out about, oh, I'm losing everything. I'm losing. Or you could just lose it, give it all away, and you'll find life. And I just got to ask you the same thing Jesus asked. What's it going to profit you in the end? You gain the whole world, but you lose your soul, you know, versus right now living for Jesus Christ, knowing that it's worth it, loving every minute of it, even through the pain, sharing the sufferings of Christ. That's the life we're calling you to. And I, I hope you join me. Because I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is absolutely worth it. He's worth it all.